I have a very loud voice. I hope it's loud enough. <laughs> um, uh, Leiden University Library is uh, the oldest university in the Netherlands. It was founded in 1575 by William, Prince of Orange, and because of its rich history, uh, our heritage collection is very large and old and very diverse. We have medieval and post medieval manuscripts, um, we have letters, printed books, maps, prints and drawings, and a very large collection of uh, early and modern photography. <coughs> but um, Leiden is also famous because of its oriental collections. From the founding of the university, the study of the Orient has been very important, as you might know. Um, Indonesia has been a colony of the Netherlands, which is a bit hard to understand now. Um, and it's still the only uh, university in the Netherlands where you can study Chinese, Korean and Japanese languages. And since 2014, Leiden University Library holds and manages the colonial collections of the Royal Tropical Institute in Amsterdam and also the library collections of the Royal Netherlands Institute of Southeast Asian and Caribbean Studies. Both very long names, so I would simply call them by their Dutch name, Kit and Kai Teofi. Um, and since then, uh, Leiden ha also houses the largest collection of Indonesia worldwide, and some of the foremost collections on South and Southeast Asia, <coughs> Caribbean, China, Japan, and Korea. So because of this international orientation, uh, we have researchers and students from all over the world. And finally, our special collections uh, are also part of our national and international heritage. And it's very important to reconstruct, for example, the development of and dissemination of, of knowledge. So when Leiden University acquired the library collections of Kit and Kai TLV, we did not only receive books, but also many digitized collections, and for which several platforms were used, a combination of custom-made and commercial solutions, and then we also had our own uh, repository, so you can imagine it's very um, splintered infrastructure. And altogether, we are currently maintaining about uh, a million digital objects and over three million uh, scans. So to offer researchers the possibility to search and browse our collections from <coughs> one central access point, the first thing we did was to migrate all the metadata to our library system, which is at this moment uh, Aleph, but in a couple <coughs> of weeks it will be Alma. Um, but for the uh, presentation and research, um, users were still directed uh, towards various repositories and each with their own design, their own functionality and also for our internal processes it's not very efficient, not very cost-friendly um, to maintain several, several repositories at a time. So to improve our outdated and fragmented infrastructure we decided in 2014 to build a new repository um, for our digital collections. And um, here you can see who are responsible for this project. <coughs> and um, basically we started this project with two main principles. Um, firstly, uh, because we want to be a trustworthy partner in education and research, the repository infrastructure should eventually be able to meet the guidelines that apply for a trusted digital repository. And secondly, the university requires that complicated infrastructure projects are carried out under architecture. So for this reason, we started our preparations uh, by setting up a project start architecture. And this PSA consisted of three aspects. Um, we started by defining how the new infrastructure fits within the policy of the library concerning uh, access, use and research of information. And secondly, we had to analyze the processes. So the new inf uh, repository infrastructure ha has to be able to facilitate intake, storage, management and access of a range of digital uh, objects from very uh, various do domains. And thirdly, uh, we had to determine which applications are needed uh, for these workflows. 
And then on the other hand, uh, we had to ask ourselves, when do we decide to join a new initiative for education parallel to our own existing uh, presentation? And to help this decision process, we developed a very uh, easy uh, business case analysis tool. And this means that you have to involve the stakeholders, uh, decide how the digital collection fits within the, the policy of the library, and analyze what is needed to make the collection available, and also make it a roadmap of the collection. So uh, first, um, define key policies for the digital special collection. Um, first step is that we have to make decisions about the presentation of our digital special collection. So we have to decide where do we want to make these collections available eh, and, and visible? Which part do we consider essential for our own repository? And which collections are better suited in another repository, maybe in a, in a national or international thematic model? And um, one example are the Dutch text collections, uh, consisting of books and journals and newspapers, for which a, a consortium of uh, Dutch academic libraries has developed an online service, and it's called Delver. And Delver is a search engine that pro provides access to Dutch historical texts from um, the collections of Dutch heritage organizations. So when we uh, in Leiden digitize Dutch text collections, we don't make them accessible, accessible within our own infrastructure, but we use Delver instead, which makes sense because then researchers can browse and search uh, through the whole set of materials. Um, but um, when these text collections are about Indonesia, you can imagine that we also want to make them available ourselves. Uh, because the, the Indonesian collection uh, are one of the core collections of our university. So, now, uh, on the other hand, we have to ask ourselves, when do we decide to join a new initiative? Um, and for this, I told you, we, we, we made this business case analysis tool, and it, it forces you to, to compare revenues with investments and preconditions. And we actually give these to the curators, the, the content curators of the collections as well, because they're not used to think about collections in, in this way. So, uh, firstly, uh, investments. What is the investment you have to make to deliver the data? Does the platform, for example, ask for a fee? Um, and for the revenues, is it beneficial for the strategy and policies of our organization? And what is the impact? What is, the, is, is it a, only a small, small data set or a very big one? And last but not least, are there any technical restrictions? Uh, do our systems meet the requirements of the platform, or are we able to make an investment to update them? And maybe uh, the most important question, what happens when we don't participate? And uh, maybe simply nothing. Um, and then the second point, redesigning our repository infrastructure. Um, when we decided to build a new repository, we focused on the digital special collections in the first place. Um, so we wanted to re replace our own digital application and the Kit and KITLV websites. Uh, for our publications and research data, we currently use DSpace, but eventually we want, want all of our collections preferably in one system. Um, so this means that uh, besides being a trusted digital repository, 
it also had to be very flexible and scalable and be, be able to handle a, a large variety of content. And, and a very important aspect were the possibilities for sharing and data aggregation because uh, national and also European funding agencies increasingly uh, require that our data can be reused in various applications such as those created for education and research but also for tourism. And at the same time, we also had very limited capacity for in-house developments. So, considering our needs and limitations, Islandora turned out to be the best choice for us. So, we asked uh, Discovery Garden to help us with the implementing process. And we also contacted our Dutch colleagues of Delft University, who had also joined Islandora. And we decided to join forces. And they start with publications and uh, research data. We start with heritage collections, and then we uh, agree that we share our experiences and best practices. <coughs> so then, designing workflows for the intake and presentation of digital collections. So um, one of the ambitions of our library, uh, as expressed in our new policy plan, is to acquire knowledge and take measures to promote a sustainable storage of data, uh, result, resulting in a data seal of approval certification. So this means that we have to develop new workflows for intake and presentation, dissemination of our digital collection based on OIS. Um, and also our digital special collections are growing rapidly. So these new workflows also had to be uh, scalable and very efficient to avoid backlogs, because this is what happened in the, in the past, that we didn't have the right workflow to make all these scans uh, and digital content available. And one, one very important aspect of this is that the roles and responsibilities are clearly defined. So for each collection, we have to establish who is responsible for which part and uh, which information does everyone need to meet, make the right decisions. And this sounds very obvious and very easy, but uh, in fact, it, it wasn't. Um, and then uh, developing workflows for uh, copyright. Um, for a long time, um, Dutch heritage organizations paid little or no attention to copyright restrictions. And this was based in the idea that we are non-commercial and work for the benefit of research and, and education. But in recent years, uh, years there have been uh, several lawsuits against libraries uh, and, and museums and archives, serious ones. So um, we really have to take that into, into account. And luckily, the Islandora infrastructure does allow us to make the um, availability uh, dependent on, on copyright regulations. But this meant uh, two things. First, that also had to be clear for ourselves uh, what users can and cannot do with the data. So are they allowed to download and reuse, uh, etc. And the big problem was that uh, the metadata were not always of uh, sufficient quality to de determine if an object was free of copyright. For example, because uh, the living years of a photographer, they were simply never, never recorded. So last year we really worked very hard to improve uh, the metadata and we started with, uh, with the collections in, with which we were most at risk and that was our modern photography collection. So now let's uh, focus on the two case studies. And the first one is uh, La Caligo. And uh, La Caligo is an epic a creation myth. Uh, from the Bucis uh, of South Sulawesi, and it's written down in manuscript form uh, between the 18th and 20th century. And the largest uh, current uh, La Calico fragment uh, consists of 12 volumes, and these 12 volumes are part of our uh, university library in, uh, in Leiden. And in 2012, uh, the book was included in uh, UNESCO's Memory of the World uh, Register. So it's a very important piece. Um, so first, uh, policy. Um, as you can understand, uh, La Calico is not just important for the academic community, but also for the general public. 
and it will be an important item in our digital Indonesian collection. But we also want to present it uh, on a separate website with its own design, with its own URL, and with introductory text in, in several several um, languages. And preferably, uh, this still means that this is part of the Aladora infrastructure, so that we don't have to build a completely new website for it. Um, secondly, process. Um, in this case, our curator of the South Asian uh, collection played an important role. Uh, she has to write a text, for example, for the, uh, for the web presentation. And our colleagues in, uh, in Jakarta, they found a sponsor for the cost of digitization. And one of the requirements uh, of this funding agency was that the collection would be made available completely open access without any limitation. So the workflow has to provide for the download of individual scans, and also uh, in high quality, and also a PDF of all the separate volumes. And thirdly, functionality. Um, we decided that we wanted to publish the scans as soon as possible. Uh, so it will be the first object uh, in the Ayagora infrastructure that will be uh, made available online this year in September. And this means that people can read the text, download the scans, uh, but you can imagine that these iconic works, like Calico, they are ideal for digital enrichment and exchange. And uh, our university library recently uh, decided to join IIIF, and we think that with a IIIF viewer and the manifest, we will be much better equipped uh, to offer customized services uh, like the possibility to, possibility to annotate and, and also to translate uh, individual uh, uh, poems, uh, maybe even by drug. So this was easy, only one object. And the second collection I want to introduce uh, is the Dutch Caribbean collection. Um, so when we um, acquired the collections of Kit and Kai um these contain also items from Dutch colonial territories, including those in the Caribbean. And in 2015, the governments of both the Netherlands and Curaçao uh, funded the digitization of these Dutch Caribbean uh, collections um, to stimulate uh, education and research, not just in the Netherlands, but, but mainly on, on the island of, of Curaçao and the other Caribbean islands. So, so they, they got their own collection back, but in, in a digital form. And this digital collection uh, consists of books, multi-volume works, photographs, archival materials, and maps, uh, all up until 1954, which is the year that uh, Curaçao became, uh, uh, the, the Dutch Caribbean islands became uh, part of the Kingdom of the Netherlands. And about 50% was already uh, digitally available <coughs> as part of these websites that we inherited. Uh, but the rest was scanned during the project and it was completed this spring. And altogether the collection consists of uh, nearly half a million scans <coughs> and, and also a lot of auto files for, for the OCR text. And at this moment um, the collection is ingested in the newly bu uh, built DCDP repository of Curaçao University Library, and this is a platform uh, called uh, SOBEC. And because the, the University of Curaçao is a partner in the consortium of digital libraries of the Hope of the Caribbean, and the content will also be presented in their repository, and this is DLOC. Um, so let's let's look at this uh, collection again from the perspective of the, the PSA uh, elements policy process and functionality. So, um, to begin with uh, policy, um, the presence um, in this DCDP and DLOC uh, portals was very important, uh, a very important first step for us, uh, because there we were sure that we would find a, a, a large potential of, of users. Yep, nearly done. And because this uh, digital collection was too large for our current infrastructure, our library originally only planned to provide links from our library catalog to DCDP. 
But after deciding uh, to go for Ayandora, uh, our business case also changed. Uh, because suddenly we were able to ingest and present the collection ourselves. And it also offered benefits for our library. Because uh, of all, you can imagine all these relationships that, uh, that, that exist uh, with other aspects of the digital collection. And, and we wanted to avoid that the new fragmented availability of our collection would, would start to exist. But this also uh, resulted in a very complex uh, collection structure in Ayodora. Um, because the, the, the maps, archives, books and images, they together make the uh, Caribbean digital library. But at the same time, the books are going to be part of the book portal, the maps of the map portal, etc. And on the other hand, we also wanted to keep the Kit and Kaitel Thay uh, digital libraries alive. And to be able to identify uh, these collections, we really, we really needed uh, the expertise of a content manager. And during the digitization project, the process, the project manager took this role. Um, but um, at this moment, the responsibility still has to be handed over to the, to the curator, and you can imagine in this case there are many, many uh, curators. And they are each responsible just for a small part of the collection, so that makes it co complex to make decisions. Um, because the project was funded by Dutch government, we also had to take their requirements into account. Uh, so they wanted uh, material to be available at Euro Europeana, in the European Library, for example. And we also had copyright issues that we had to take into account. So we agreed that Curaçao University Library would take this as their responsibility. And until they are finished, um, all materials that are not copyright free will only be available within the building of the library, both uh, in the Netherlands and uh, also on, on Curaçao. And as you can imagine, uh, digitization of this collection is not an end in itself, just a, a, a means to strengthen the links between universities of Leiden and of Curaçao. And um, at the end of the year, we will be organizing a conference, and we will invite researchers, and we are also starting a pilot to make this digital collection available for data and text mining. And uh, we are looking at all the various ways in which the data can be delivered, uh, encouraging use and reuse. Um, not all functionality, however, is uh, already available in Ayanor. And this is uh, an example from the Kit uh, Maps portal. Uh, two things that are lacking are possibility to present maps in series, as you can see here. Uh, you can make compound objects, but then you only get a row. And here it's like a crossword, a crossword puzzle, as you can see. And uh, also geo-referencing would be something that we would like to do. And also in this case, we hope that IIIF uh, will offer improvements in, uh, in terms of functionality. Uh, because we not only want our repository to be content agnostic, agnostic but uh, also the viewers. And at this moment, it, it's not like that. And um, so IIIF will offer us the possibility to use one viewer for all material types. So to conclude, um, the coming year, we will have to spend a lot of time on ingesting all these 3 million uh, scans and also with matching functionality. But as we've seen, uh, building a new repository is not simply a matter of ingesting. It's not a technical thing. It's a very complex process and all various aspects uh, come together. Um, so at the end, we hope that uh, uh, the res results of the project, uh, project will be that we have an extendable infrastructure that makes us much better equipped to integrate new developments in our system, like IIIF. And we have a much better alignment between front and back of us in the, in the, in the library. And uh, maybe very, uh, most important, uh, we will have an open organization and we will be much better equipped to collaborate with all kinds of local, national and international partners. So, um, in that way, the design of the new repository and the building of it has functioned as an instrument of change. Because of this integral approach, uh, not, 
not only concentrating on the technical parts of the infrastructure, but also on the policies and all the associated workflows. And all the employees in the library put a shared idea of the goals. And as a result, from the back office, departments are cooperating efficiently. And even more importantly, we also achieve a greater sense of involvement. And that's really important. And as everyone became much more aware of his uh, or her role uh, and responsibility in the whole process. So from the curator's decision uh, on the digital collection we want to acquire, to management deciding about cost investment and system librarians ingesting the collection in Isla Dora. Thank you.